Flourish Australia is a community-based not-for-profit, providing practical support to people with a lived experience of a complex mental health issue. We work alongside and complement other services to provide complex mental health support. This can include GPs, psychologists, other service providers and the government. Flourish Australia has supported me in so many ways. They've helped me understand and manage my mental health. They've provided assistance with living and they've also helped me find a house for my son and I. Flourish Australia has provided me with work. I think employment is really important for my mental health because it sort of gives you something to do with your time but you're also giving back to the community which is really important for me. We are a person-led organisation. We develop relationships with people accessing our services. We listen to people, for they are their own experts in identifying their recovery journey. What sets us apart from many organisations is that a significant proportion of that workforce are peer workers. who are integrated in teams across our service footprint and programs. People feel safe really quickly with somebody that they think has been through some similar experiences. It's a beautiful kind of magic that peer work has that I don't see in any other discipline in quite the same way. Flourish Australia has supported me with my anxiety. It's a very friendly environment and our supervisors are always there to help us. It's about connecting with other people. It's also about family, like we feel like a family here. That's something I really appreciate about Flourish Australia. Our programs help people become connected with their communities to make friends, find work, learn new skills, find a home and gain a sense of achievement. It makes Flourish Australia a safe place, a place where mental wellbeing thrives. Welcome everyone. Um, appreciate the, the comments that we had around the sound. I hope you can hear me okay now. Um, if you can't, by all means, please put it in the chat and we'll we'll look to fix it. So thanks so much everyone for attending. Um, I'm Susan McCarthy, the Chief Operating Officer of Flourish Australia, although at the moment acting CEO. So this is my last official day of Mark All returns next week. I have to say this is probably the most exciting thing that he's asked me to do for the month. So I'm very pleased to be ending it on this note. Um, it's my absolute pleasure um, to host this event today. I'm also hoping for some tips because I'm championing our internal step challenge in a few weeks. So I am really going to be listening to what I can do to motivate everybody else as we as we, we as we move to our uh, move our mood step challenge in mid mid November. Uh, shortly, I'll introduce the remarkable and inspiring Donna Ingram, Faye Jackson, and Professor Elizabeth Moore, who will support this program today. Uh, and then Elizabeth will be introducing Associate Professor Simon Rosenbaum. Um, I appreciate all of us on the call today are interested in the impacts and benefits of physical health and what that means for our mental health and well-being. Uh, today we'll be hearing from an expert in this field and I'm really, as I said before, I'm really looking forward, forward to it. I was thinking about this session uh, during the week and, you know, like all of us, probably reflecting on our own physical health and what I can do, not only for myself, but how can I support my colleagues, um, the people that we support, and of course, our family and friends to be more active and healthy. I think many of us always want to do more, but sometimes there can be real and perceived barriers that get in the way of us doing that. And like many of us, including myself, we know the physical benefits, the physical health benefits, particularly the mental health benefits. I just think the difference it makes, even a small amount of movement can make a real difference to our daily moods and feelings. As you know, at Flourish Australia, we support over 10,000 people uh, from psychosocial supports through to clinical supports. And many of the people we support often talk to us about their physical health needs. And there's a lot of things that we try to do to help them 
um, with that, as well as their mental health, you know, they're not mutually exclusive, which I'm sure many of you know, and which is why you've come to this webinar today to be able to talk about some of this. Uh, so, as I said, you know, today it's all about hearing uh, from Associate Professor Simon Rosenbaum about the benefits of exercise, how the impact that has on our mental health, and I'm sure many of us here will take a lot away from this. I've already received a lot of questions, but by all means, put more in the Q&A or the chat. I'll keep an eye on that as we go throughout the session. Um, but we're really looking forward to hearing from you too on what you want to learn a bit more about um, throughout this session today. So as I said before, I'm really pleased to be joined uh, by other people to start this event off today. The first one is the Welcome to Country by Donna Igram. I just want to take a moment to introduce Donna and then I'll hand over to Donna to do her Welcome to Country. So Donna's Aboriginal family connections are the Wiradjuri of Central West New South Wales. She is the mother of four adult children and the grandmother of seven so far, and was born and raised in Sydney on Gadigal land. Donna is proud to be the cultural representative of the local Aboriginal community in Sydney. Donna has worked in Aboriginal affairs, government and community organisations in Sydney for the past 35 years, mostly in education. She was also elected to represent her community as councillor on the former Sydney Regional Council of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. Donna holds a diploma in Aboriginal Community Development and is a graduate of the Indigenous Women's Leadership Development Program. Donna is involved in several community consultation groups, especially in regards to women's issues and NAIDOC week in the Redfin inner city area. She's often called upon for advisory panels and community consultation groups. Donna was recently nominated to the Board of Mugullan Performing Arts, a role she is very much looking forward to. Donna has presented Welcome to Country at many conferences and major events in Sydney for the past 13 years. And we are so pleased to have Donna here today to do the Welcome to Country. And I'll now hand over to you, Donna. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here with permission from my elders to offer you welcome to country for Flourish Australia's Mental Health Month, Month Let's Do Lunch webinar with this year's theme, We All Have a Role to Play. It gives me pride to represent my community in this important cultural protocol. It shows respect for and recognition to the unique position of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australian culture and history. We are presenting from the traditional land of the Wongu, who are one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation, which is bordered by the Hawkesbury, the Georges, and the Nepean Rivers. I'm an Aboriginal woman who proudly identifies with the Wiradjuri Nation from Central West New South Wales. I was born on Eora country, and I've had the privilege to live, work, and raise my four children on this land for most of my life. As Susan mentioned, my family has grown and I'm now a proud grandmother to Aaliyah, Elijah, Kalila, Lakota, Jake Jr, Aki, and baby Kate has recently joined the family. My wish for my grandchildren is to grow up happy and healthy in a safe and inclusive society where they believe that their dreams can come true. I acknowledge the Wongal, their spirits and ancestors who will always remain with the land Mother Earth, and I thank them for their ongoing custodianship. I pay my respects to our elders, both past and present, and we must never forget the sacrifices made by our leaders to create a better future for Aboriginal people. I do this as a reminder and as a tribute to elders and those who have gone before us to fight for land rights, justice and equity for our communities. I extend my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from all clans and nations who are present this afternoon. I also recognise our non-Aboriginal sisters and brothers from all backgrounds who walk beside us to support people with the lived experience of complex mental health issues. At this point, I would normally say I now offer you a warm and sincere welcome to the land of the Wongal of the Eora Nation. Wish you a safe stay on the land and safe travel from the land. I have the same wish for you all, whichever country you're viewing from. On behalf of my community and the Wongal, I wish you all an interesting and enjoyable time hearing from guest speaker, Associate Professor Simon Rosenbaum, about the importance of activity being integral to mental wellbeing. Susan will also facilitate a Q&A in line with this year's theme, We All Have a Role to Play. 
In closing, we remember that this is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Thanks everyone, have a great afternoon. Thanks so much, Donna. We really appreciate it, um, especially as we, as I just want to acknowledge, you know, the referendum that the country has gone through. Um, just acknowledging that for you and for other communities and for everyone that's been impacted by that. So really appreciative of you coming today and doing the welcome to country. So next up, I'm going to introduce, uh, introduce I should say, um, Faye Jackson to do our acknowledgement of a lived experience and again firstly I just want to talk a little bit about Faye and her, her wealth of experience and expertise as well. So Faye is the General Manager of Inclusion with Flourish Australia, the inaugural, I always struggle with that word, the inaugural New South Wales Deputy Mental Health Commissioner and founder of Vision in Mind. Faye sits on multiple federal mental health steering groups committees such as the National Mental Health Commission Vision 2030 Strategic Plan Steering Group and the Equally Well Steering Group. She is currently working with the Melbourne University training 3,000 first and third year psychology students, which is phenomenal, and other universities as a researcher and guest lecturer. She is the mental health representative on the Cancer Australia Working Group and has been a guest on the ABC's One Plus One and Q&A. She has published a number of peer-reviewed papers and book chapters and has won many awards for her work in mental health advocacy, including the Paul Harris Fellowship, the Rotary Health Research Fund and the Australian Meditorious Service to Community Medal. Thanks so much, Faye, for joining, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Susan. Um, I want to acknowledge the um, the Bunjalung people. Um, uh, that I'm living on their land, and I'm going to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and give my undertaking to walk softly on this land and to do what I can do to improve the well-being of Aboriginal people. Um, I want to pay my respects to our respects to people with lived experience. Um, like me, many of us have suffered terribly at the hands of, um, well, often that trauma is what's caught triggered our mental health issues but then we've also really struggled with the way we've been treated in some mental health services some mental health services caused us more trauma on top of the trauma that we already experienced initially so I want to pay, pay our respects to people who have passed already who who struggled terribly with the way they were treated with community attitudes discrimination towards them um, and and the complete marginalization of them in their lives and the devaluing of what they have their strengths and what they have to offer we all also want to acknowledge people who are currently in um, mental health services wanting to access mental health services or unable to get mental health services that they want to get and those who don't ever want to be in a mental health service again because of the experiences that they've had and we we offer our support to do what we can to advocate for everyone now and in the future who really struggle with their with their their traumas and the 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 attitudes that people have shown towards them the way they feel trying to manage what goes on in their minds and trying to manage the way people respond to them. We are valuable members of the community and it's time that the community and services really listened, really listened to our voices, our value, our experiences and what we need. And we give our undertaking to do all that we can to do that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Faye. Really appreciate that, that acknowledgement. Um, so lastly, I just I have the pleasure now of introducing our board chair, Professor Elizabeth Moore. So just again to do a little bit about the fantastic experience of Elizabeth before I hand over. So Professor Elizabeth Moore's most recent role has been as the Chief Academic Officer and Director of Research at Study Group. Elizabeth has been a senior academic across a range of universities, including the Dean of the Macquarie Graduate School of Management and the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Macquarie and Canberra Universities. 
Elizabeth has extensive experience on a number of NFP boards, obviously ours, but including NIDA, and in consulting to both private and public sector organisations. Elizabeth has also published widely, locally and internationally, especially in the fields of communication and change management and on the implementation of the NDIS. Professor Moore has worked in executive education and has been called upon for expert media comment on issues related to management practice and education. Professor Moore has also been a counsellor on the New South Wales State Council of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and is currently on its NFP's Chairs Forum. Before becoming a university academic, Elizabeth worked as a classical ballet dancer in theatre and television and in the advertising industry. And I'm so pleased now to hand over to Elizabeth to do the introductions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Dear colleagues, people who access our support, families and carers, supporters and friends, thanks so much for joining us today for this special event uh, at the close of Mental Health Month. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And um, as with they acknowledge all those with lived experience, their families and supporters for really enriching us through their many contributions and their lives of resilience and courage. Flourish Australia, as you would have noted in the opening um, the video, is a beacon of hope and support for individuals who face the complexities of mental health issues. For more than 65 years, we've been tirelessly serving Australian communities, offering person-led, recovery-focused mental health support. And in a world where mental and physical health are too often treated as separate entities, Flourish has recognised that the two are inextricably linked. Our mission is clear, to help those living with complex mental health challenges prioritise their physical health alongside their mental well-being. Sadly, the statistics are sobering. Individuals with complex mental health issues are up to two times more likely to experience a range, a range of physical conditions and their life expectancy can be reduced by at least 25 years. But despite these staggering numbers, the stigma surrounding mental health, as Faye indicated to us, often prevents people from accessing the services that they so desperately need. Flourish Australia, with its unwavering commitment to holistic support, provides a strong foundation on which those in need can indeed depend. This was acknowledged recently in the last meeting of our fabulous Community Council, hello to Community Council members if you're here, where discussion occurred on how we can better use our gyms and provide a range of exercise classes, including online to those who are using our services. As Susan indicated, my first life was, a classic, was as a classical ballet dancer. So I do understand the link between mind and body. Um, but sadly, although there are beautiful images associated with ballet dancing, as many backstage people would know, um, there's a lot of trauma. Um, and sadly, many of the stereotypes that abound um, include things such as body shaming. Um, and this, of course, includes um, other people in equivalent roles, such as those in um, elite athlete positions. And of course, many of the people um, with whom we walk are those who are dealing with the um, physical consequences of prescribed medication. We understand that, and that's why we take a holistic view. But I have to say that recently, I can't, I can't match Donna's seven grandchildren, I have three, but recently they conned me into watching a wonderful movie on television called Champions, which I would thoroughly recommend, and it's about a talented but downtrodden basketball coach who helps a group of children with intellectual challenges realise that they are in fact champions of life already. He coaches them to participate in a prestigious basketball tournament 
um, and though they only get silver medals, they do understand that their life experiences, as we say in um, our brochures, the life experiences of those with complex mental health already make them fantastic champions of life. So congratulations. But here at Flourish Guiding Us is, is our inaugural Flourish Foundation ambassador, the very first, is um, Professor Simon Rosenbaum, a visionary, a very young visionary, and an advocate for the in inextricable link between physical and mental health. With a belief that good health is a fundamental human right, Simon passionately supports healthcare professionals in them becoming champions for the importance of physical activity for mental well-being. He's dedicated to narrowing the immense gap between individuals with complex mental health issues and the broader community when it comes to physical health and life expectancy. His wealth of knowledge is derived from years of frontline experience working with individuals worldwide whose lives have been disrupted by mental health issues. Instead of just sitting in the ivory tower that many know um, are universities, he supported young people experiencing psychosis, veterans and emergency service workers living with PTSD, importantly being in refugee camps in Bangladesh, supporting people with challenging situations patients in inpatient in mental health facilities and those in broader community mental health settings. That, of course, has not meant that he hasn't been a fantastic academic, as I'll allude to in a moment. His expertise in self-care, particularly in the realm of physical activity, draws on a background in exercise physiology. He was awarded a doctorate for his research focused on the role of physical activity for people living with mental health issues, emphasising the significance of non-pharmacological approaches for promoting mental health, such as exercise and nutrition. As a Scientia Associate Professor in the Faculty of Medicine at UNSW, Simon's impact has been felt globally. His contributions to the field have been recognised by the Clarivate highly cited list for mental health. As I said, aside from dashing around the world, um, he's had managed to have 220 peer-reviewed publications, no mean feat for any academic, written a textbook and a Lancet Commission report, all while being an academic and doing all those other wonderful things. As I said, he's not just an academic, he's a leader and an activist a wonderful person if you get to know him. As the president of the Australasian Society for Traumatic Stress Studies and the co-chair of the Olympic Refuge Foundation's think tank on sport and humanitarian settings, Simon is pushing the boundaries constantly of how exercise and sports can be a tool for healing and transformation for everybody in the community, but particularly those dealing with complex mental health. Today we're gathered to celebrate both Flourish Australia's enduring commitment to holistic well-being and Simon's unwavering dedication to bridging the gap between physical and mental health. Together they inspire us with their passions, their ideas and their determination to improve the lives of those living with complex mental health issues. Please join me in welcoming yet another champion of change, Flourish Australia um, and um, a, a proud ambassador of Flourish Australia and Associate Professor Simon Rosenbaum, a wonderful advocate for us all. And you'll recognise how um, committed he is when he tells us where he's beaming in from. Over <laughs> to you, Simon, and thank you so much. Thank No, thank you, Elizabeth. I'm a bit speechless after that introduction um everything that i thought i was going to say has just gone totally out of my head but thank you and thank you for your um guidance and mentorship in this work as well it's been an absolute privilege to work alongside you and to be involved with flourish um so thank you and also to to susan donna and faye thank you for that introduction faye i was talking about you today with a group of mental health physiotherapists here in in colombia which i'll 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 talk about so I'll just share my slides and I'll apologize to everyone that I am in a, a quiet 
unusual environment. Um, so uh, let me just get these up and hopefully everyone can see those slides now. Um, so welcome and thank you for, for having me. It's a, it's a real honour to, to be involved with anything to do with Flourish. So um, I jumped at the opportunity knowing that I was going to be away. And this is obviously a topic that's very close to my heart and something I'm very passionate about. So any excuse to be able to talk about it, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, firstly, I'd also like to acknowledge the lands that I'm from, uh, the Gadigal and Bidjigal people. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that beautiful lake that you can see in that picture, because that's where I am at the moment, about 200 kilometres northwest of Bogota um, in Colombia in a place called Tenazuka. Um, and I'd really like to acknowledge the Mwiskal people who were the, the traditional owners of the land here. And that lake is actually a very sacred lake to those people. It's one of nine sacred lakes and you're not allowed to swim or, or enter the lake. Um, and we're hearing lots of stories about, about knowledge and about what is knowledge and generating knowledge, which has been a really interesting um, for me over the past few days. And, and I'm here with a bunch of mental health physiotherapists and mental health professionals from across Colombia where we've got a few days together to, to talk about this this exact topic around movement and mental health. And just to acknowledge that here in, in Latin America, there's something really exciting going on around their approaches to recognising not only the connection between body and mind, but also between land, between body and land and between, between nutrition and food and ancestral knowledge. Um, lots of approaches that, that that I think we can learn a lot from in, in Australia. So while we have some some great referral pathways and systems and structures, I think we've got lots to learn around what we can actually do when we we can work together. Okay, so that's that's the building that we've been in the past few days here in 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 Colombia. And there were a few things that I just sort of wanted to mention about the, the context here that I think are really relevant and. Some of those things are the history here in Colombia, including the, the armed conflict, the violence that, that people have lived through. Um, there are multiple displacement crises happening simultaneously here. There are internally displaced people, including Afro-Colombians. There's a Venezuelan crisis with Venezuelan refugees walking through the country. Uh, there's ongoing issues around uh, the drug trade and, and, the, and still areas of armed conflict. Um, but for me, it's 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 that background that has actually led to what what we're seeing emerge here with the culture of the the mental health physical therapy approaches um, that I think is really exciting and uh, and really uh, will be leading the world around these these sorts of approaches and what's and what's happening. Okay, so today I'm it's it's also nine it's nine p.m. here in in Colombia and I thought the last thing people want to hear is a whole bunch of boring data and it's it's not what I'm going to talk about. So I will provide a bit of evidence and I will talk about the evidence, but I'm far less interested now in this question of does exercise help improve mental health or does moving our bodies help us feel good? We know the answer. The answer is yes. Great. Who cares? The real question is how do we support people? How do we help people, particularly those that are excluded, those that don't have access? What do we need to do? What are the opportunities? What can we change? to support people to be able to participate. And for me, this this statement from an editorial sums it up perfectly. Leisure time, physical activity is a class privilege. So what we mean by that is that to have access to free time, to choose, to have the ability to have sneakers, clothing, whatever you need, to live in a safe environment where you can choose to go and go for do some activity, to have access to childcare, nutrition, whatever it is that you need is an absolute privilege. So we have to stop with the idea that we can just tell people, hey, go and do some exercise because it's not going to work. If we want to think about and what the evidence does tell us is that the most disadvantaged, the most vulnerable, they're the ones that we should be targeting with these programs because they're the ones that if we can support people to engage and to participate, we're going to have big shifts in, in not only how people feel and symptoms, but overall health outcomes, economic benefits. So let's start thinking about how do we remove the barriers to support people to be able to participate in exercise. Now, if I start shivering, the temperature has also rapidly plummeted here, so I'm sitting outside and it's absolutely freezing. Um Okay, so this picture I took a couple of years ago inside the world's biggest refugee camp in Bangladesh, where there are currently over 1 million Rohingya refugees who were forced to flee uh, neighbouring Myanmar due to, to, to genocide. 
um, into southern Bangladesh, which was already one of the poorest regions of, of Bangladesh, which is a very low resource country. Now, there's a couple of things in this photo that I want to talk about. So one, what is that game? It's it's pretty amazing. It's called Chinlon. It's like volleyball, but it's played only with your feet. So you can see it's it's extremely athletic with this cane ball. Um, so a few things. What can we see in this photo? We can see people coming together. So there's community, there's social interaction, there's connection. It's attracting people. They've 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 come in. Um we can see people are participating. So they're, they're, they're active, they're moving. There's also people watching and we know there's mental health benefits associated with this. What I'm far more interested though, in this photo is who isn't in the photo. And if once we, we point that out, it becomes quite clear, but the people who aren't in the photo are women. It's people with disabilities. They're the ones that are not represented. Now, too often when we think about sport, when we think about physical activity, we think about able-bodied, fit, young, healthy people. And that's what we need to reclaim and we need to challenge. This isn't about that. This isn't about aesthetics. This isn't about how we look. This is about the impact that these sorts of approaches can have on our, on our health outcomes. Now, I promised that I wouldn't have too much uh, slides around evidence and, and meta-analyses because they are boring. But if people are interested and I can make the slides available, but this is an open access review that we published earlier this year in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And this is a big review of all the clinical trials of exercise and depression. So over 40 clinical trials, I think it was over 1,500 participants, showing very clearly the impact of, of exercise as a component of treatment. Now, something I really need to stress here is that the evidence doesn't tell us that exercise replaces mental health care. And I, I can't emphasise that enough. We're not saying that if you just exercise, everything is fine. That's not the case. Think of exercise like a tool in someone's tool belt, yeah? But it's a tool that can also improve physical health outcomes. It's a tool that, if we get it right, can have a big impact on a whole range of outcomes in addition to mental health. Um, so that's the, 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 the sort of broad summary of the evidence that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide. Now, this poster some people might be familiar with. I mean, I, I talk about this a lot. This is a, a WHO poster talking about what we call the big four risk factors. So protecting people from smoking, healthy nutrition, physical activity, and avoiding harmful use of alcohol. Now, you can see there this is referring to cardiovascular disease and that we can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease by protecting people around these modifiable risk factors. Now, the evidence we have is that we can cross out cardiovascular disease and replace that with poor mental health. And that's how strong the evidence is. So everyone's aware that, that these risk factors are related to cardiovascular health, but not so aware that these are as important for mental health as well. And for people interested, and again, this is one of the, the, the last bits of evidence I'll actually show, this is a big meta review that was led by our, our colleague and friend, Dr. Joe Firth, who's done some fantastic work in this area and has really been at the forefront, where we looked at all the evidence around those risk factors um, and some diagnoses there, including ADHD, anxiety, depression, bipolar, and psychotic disorders. And importantly, what those arrows show is the thickness of those arrows represent the strength of the evidence. So we can see very clearly the, the, the strength of the evidence regarding physical activity and regarding movement and the impact. Now, something that Elizabeth touched on earlier is the, the uh, comorbidity or the poor physical health that we see in people living with mental illness and the risk of poor physical health. Now, in, 20, in 2019, we, we had a Lancet Commission on this topic, again, led by Joe Firth. Um, now, for those that aren't aware, a Lancet Commission, the, the Lancet is one of the most influential medical journals. Um, a Lancet Commission is a topic that they deem of being of broad international significance. So there's been previous commissions on things like back pain, opioid addiction. Um, and the fact that we had a commission on the physical health of people living with mental illness shows how important this issue is from a global perspective. This isn't just unique to one region. And we can see that quote, protecting the physical health of people with mental illness should be considered an international priority for reducing the personal, social and economic burden of mental health conditions. I've also now got a wet dog that's just come up right next to me. Um, I'm going to summarise the commission in four dot points. 
Yeah, so this is, the again, one of the last bits of data we're going to show. Mental illness is associated with poor physical health, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So the risk, as Elizabeth pointed out, is up to two times higher compared to people that aren't living with mental illness. These what we call lifestyle factors, so smoking, alcohol, sleep, physical inactivity, we see disturbances or changes in these risk factors from illness onset. And even there's, we have data showing that there's changes in these factors that precedes people actually seeking mental health care. Yep, so it's really important that there are changes in these factors very early on. There was a recommendation in the commission that was very strong that mental health services should be providing sufficient access to supervised exercise programs based on the evidence that we have. Yeah, now I know that this is a, a lofty target or a lofty goal, but if we just think about the evidence and we don't worry about resources, the evidence is strong enough for this recommendation to be made, that mental health services should be providing access to supervised programs. And finally, that the physical health services need to be prevention focused. So we need to be thinking about getting in early, just as we talk about early intervention for mental health care, we need to be thinking about prevention focused, early intervention for physical health care. And we've got really good data, um, again, projects led by Professor Jackie Curtis, who's done some amazing work in this area, showing that with young people commencing antipsychotic medication, if we can intervene with an appropriate lifestyle program at day one, so as soon as medication is commenced, we can prevent the antipsychotic-induced weight gain from occurring um, and maintain those benefits at two years. So there's good evidence around why we should be thinking about prevention. One of the, the questions that we, we often get asked is, well, what type of movement or, or activity is best for mental health? Um, there's a very easy answer to that, which is the activity that someone enjoys. Um, so I can't stress enough the importance of enjoyment um, and actually finding, supporting someone to find an activity that they enjoy. And that's really our job as practitioners is to support people. So I'll show a couple of different photos here, and that's a, a gym or, or a not gym that I'll talk a bit about. Um, it's a project I'm really excited about that we're working on at the moment at the Addison Road Community Centre. But we do have ev evidence around sort of that gym-based traditional exercise-based approaches. There's good evidence around the mental health impacts there. In a completely different context, this is a photo of a rock climbing wall in the Bacar Valley in Lebanon, which is also a, a big refugee context. Um, a charity that I, I work with called ClimAid built this climbing wall inside a refugee camp in the Bacar Valley. Um, and we've just finished a trial looking at the impact of, of that program. And some of the most interesting findings was when we interviewed young men and they told us that the biggest thing for them was learning that women uh, can be stronger and more capable climbers than they can. And so the impact that it had on gender role and gender identity was was, was really interesting in that context. That's an example of that. That's a physical activity program, but the benefits far outweigh or are far different to just thinking about purely symptoms or purely physical health. There's impacts around social cohesion, around gender, around integration. Um, we had people from the host community and the refugee populations working together um, and participating together for the outcome. So that's climbing. That's another example. This photo, which is a few years old now, was taken in, in Gaziantep in Turkey, uh, close to the Syrian border, working with a, a mental health organisation there where we were using elastic bands as a form of resistance training to, to support not only the health outcomes of the staff, but to give them some skills that they can use with the clients they were supporting. Um, and again, we've got good evidence around strength training as a modality to improve mental health. Often people, when we talk about the type of movement, people often think aerobic exercise or that heart and lung exercise is, is more important. Not quite the case. Um, we just have more studies that have utilised that approach. Um, but strength training or the muscle building activities can be just as important and just as effective. But again, keeping in mind that it's the activity that someone enjoys that's the most important. And finally, here's a, a picture of a, a yoga program in South Australia that was run by Dr. Jacinta Brinsley, um, who's done some fantastic work looking at the relationship between yoga and mental health outcomes. Again, yoga can be highly effective. Um, and for some people, it might be more acceptable than, than a traditional gym, so it can be a good pathway 
into other programs as well. So basically any type of movement can be beneficial. We just need to support people to find the type that they enjoy. Now, this is a bit of a boring slide, but it is it is important, and it's these different terminology because we do get a bit stuck on this sometimes, and for some people, exercise can be a bit of a dirty word, which I, I totally understand. But I'll just explain a little bit the difference between physical activity, exercise, and sport. So first of all, physical activity, the broad umbrella term that refers to literally any bodily movement. So I could be, if I was standing up, walking up and down, or pacing, that's considered physical activity. Walking to the shops to collect the groceries or, or, or daily chores, whatever we're doing, that can all be physical activity. And the, a lot of the evidence we have is around physical activity. It's not just structured exercise. So exercise is a subset of physical activity. It sits underneath physical activity and it refers to planned, structured, intentional movement. Now, I think often, and social media has got a bit to, to answer for here with the idea that exercise, for me, has been hijacked entirely by the fitness industry. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's linked to things like weight loss and aesthetics and how we look, which is really problematic because that, I think, further divides between those that identify with being an exerciser versus those that don't. And that can be a real problem. And then underneath that, again, we have sport, which is that uh, often... Um, you know, the, the organised formal sporting environments, often for competition. Now, competition is an interesting one. It can be good. It can be problematic. And I'll talk a bit about that later on. Okay, so in the past couple of years, I've been spending uh, most of my, my time has been around looking at a humanitarian or emergency context and thinking about where the role of physical activity fits in there. And this started for me in Bangladesh with the Rohingya response. And I first travelled there with the idea of seeing why this would be a bad idea, thinking, of course, we've got to address basic needs first. Um, but the first time I drove through the refugee camp, what I could see everywhere was kids playing some form of sport um, in the pouring rain, even if they didn't have a ball with tied plastic bags, whatever they were utilising. It, it was very clear that was a part of what was happening in the camp. And then... I returned and did some formal research where we, we managed to interview groups, including women, to find out how they uh, how they viewed and utilised physical activity as a strategy. And we learnt you know, really interesting things around, uh, you know, we heard a story of women waking up early in the morning before the men were awake in camp to go on a walk together. And when we asked why was that happening, they would tell us it was due to what they called tension, which was a, a local idiom of distress, of psychological distress. Um, and so as we looked closer, we could see actually this was a big part of what was happening. Now, when you think about mental health in, in emergency or humanitarian context, they have this pyramid, this four-layered pyramid. And so down the bottom is the first level, which is basic services and security. Then we move up to level two, which is the community and family support. Then what's called focus support, followed by specialised services. Now, sport and physical activity is normally considered as being that level two, that community and family support. And that's true, it does fit there. But actually, we can conceptualise a role for physical activity and for supporting people to engage in physical activity across every single level of this pyramid. And I'll explain a little bit more about what we mean. And this is work that we've been doing together with the Olympic Refuge Foundation. So if we think about physical activity at each level and we think about level one, we're talking about simply providing access to equipment. So I'll give you an example. We might have a football team fly into a refugee camp and hand out a whole bunch of soccer balls and then leave. And that's great. They're providing equipment. They're providing some infrastructure. Um, but there's no supervision. There's no support around that. And we can think about the same in, in, in Australia in our context about when we're telling people to exercise or move. What do we have access to? the services we're providing. That second layer, we can think about existing structures in the community. So this might be a gym. It might be our local gym. It might be the local park run. And for those that don't know park run, it's a, a 5K run that's that's available in most suburbs, I think, across Australia. Or there's heaps of them available. It's free. It's a community event every week. You can go and, and, and test yourself against the 5K course. You can walk or run. Um, so it's that existing resources that are available. Yeah? Now, 
one of the key things is that those local gyms may not be be safe. They may not be psychologically safe. They may not be in a, a supportive environment for everyone to attend. And we know that's the case. You know, we know that again, coming back to that idea that leisure time activity is is, is a class privilege. You know, it's 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 safe and accessible for a certain bit of our population. So then the next level is thinking: How could we make those existing structures, those existing services? more safe, more appropriate, more targeted for people living with with poor mental health or people in the community that need a bit of additional support. So one simple example is what about training staff in things like mental health first aid? So thinking about personal trainers, thinking about our exercise scientists, our exercise physiologists, having that training in foundational mental health skills. Um, and there's a lot of work happening within professional sporting organisations as well about upskilling people within the club to have some skills around mental health. And then finally, at the top, we've got specialised support. And that's where we might have, you know, a, a mental health trained exercise physiologist or physiotherapist providing additional support within a program. And we've got good evidence that programs run by health professionals uh, have less dropout, better attendance and better outcomes. But the key thing here is actually for me about we have to match the, the resources to the need of the individual and the communities we're trying to support. We can't expect that that level one intervention is going to support for people that need specialised support or specialised services. So we need to match the level of support uh, or match the resources, sorry, to, to the needs of the individuals that we're trying to reach. Now, we spoke before about the question of uh, what type of activity is best. There are some other questions to consider, and this was a, a fantastic piece led by Stuart Vella, who's a colleague from Wollongong University, again, doing fantastic work in, in elite sport and mental health. Um, and I think we've got the QR code there. So some of the other questions to consider in addition to what you do is when and why you're doing it. Something else that we talk about is where you do it. Now, here we talk about the green gym and the blue gym. So green gym refers to activity done outside, and the blue gym refers to activity done in or around water. Now, there are there appear to be added benefits from doing activity in, in green spaces or, or blue spaces, but I think we've got to be really cautious with that conclusion because, for me, if you're lucky enough to live by a beautiful park or a beautiful beach, then, of course, we're going to have added benefits of utilising those spaces. But we need to be careful that we're not sending the message that unless you have access to those spaces, you can't benefit. So that's absolutely not the case. But if we are talking about promoting activity and you do have access to those spaces, fantastic, try to try to utilise them. Then there's a the question of who you do it with. Excuse me. Um, we know the social support, the social connection is absolutely critical and um, can be one of the most important factors. And then finally, this is a really important point. How is it delivered? The quality of that supervision. And we know that that is absolutely critical to mental health outcomes. And I'll tell you why with an example from a project in northern Uganda in a conflict setting. Now, you might be thinking, this: how can this possibly be relevant to, to, to Australia? But I promise you it is. Um, this was a great piece of work done by a colleague and friend of mine, Justin Richards. This was his PhD. Um, northern Uganda in Gulu is a, is a conflict or post-conflict setting. And he was there evaluating a sport for development program. So this was a, a football program. Now, the participants were mainly child soldiers, previous for, former child soldiers. They'd been exposed to severe trauma. Uh, what they did was they put them into teams and they needed coaches. So they recruited local community members as volunteer coaches. Okay, so those coaches had no training in how to be a coach, no training in mental health, or especially in, in trauma-exposed people. Now, the only thing they knew about coaching was what you see on the English Premier League, which is angry men running up and down the sidelines screaming. And so that's exactly what happened. And then if you look at the results, what happened, the mental health outcomes decreased. They got worse. Yeah, so, so it had a negative impact on the mental health outcomes of the participants. Now, that's not at all a surprise when we think about this competitive environment with the coaches screaming at you and the background of these participants. Now, just for a second, imagine what would have happened if those coaches had a little bit of training around mental health, around participatory approaches, 
And even better, imagine if we had a mental health professional alongside those coaches, what could have happened and what could have been the outcome from this project, which, of course, this project is hugely important because of the valuable lesson it's given us around the importance of the quality of that supervision. We can't just give people a ball and say, great, we've provided a mental health intervention. There's, there's a lot more we need to do to maximise and utilise these interventions appropriately. Now, one of the things that has been a focus of, of my work recently has been how do we bring that mental health workforce and physical health workforce closer together? Because they've both got, got expertise that we can, we can learn from. And this was taken a, a few months ago in, in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. And we ran a half day training with the, the mental health professionals working inside the camp in Cox's Bazaar. Um, this was work done supported by the Olympic Refuge Foundation where we were workshopping some of the stuff that we're covering today around the evidence, but we also spent time brainstorming what is physical activity, what is exercise for not only the host Bangladeshi community, but also for the Rohingya refugees and identifying avenues where we can utilise and, and help to promote more activity. So, you know, one unique example in that context is prayer five times a day for the Rohingya community. Um, and that involves a form of physical activity. So how do we utilise that as a way of promoting engagement? Um, you know, this work we've also done in response to the Ukraine crisis with the Olympic Refuge Foundation in Poland and Moldova, um, surrounding countries where it's taken in a lot of Ukrainian refugees. Um, one of the most interesting ones we did was in Poland, where for one week we had one mental health professional and one physical education teacher from every region in Poland come together for one week. And we ran a joint training with them together. And then at the end of that week, they went back to their regions together in their pairs with one PE teacher and one mental health professional where they're running these joint trainings together. Um, and the PE teachers are getting ongoing supervision from the mental health professionals and the mental health professionals are getting ongoing supervision with the PE teachers. Um, and we're seeing that that's, that's been highly effective. So there's lots of lessons here for us in Australia as well. How do our allied health workforce get better training around mental health, skills around mental health can be better integrated with the mental health team? But likewise, on the other side, how do we support our mental health professionals to, to be more physical health informed and to understand more of the evidence and, and the opportunity that we can use around these physical approaches? Now, we've been sort of talking about this for a long time now, since 20-something, but this we wrote in 2016 and the themes still apply today. And we looked at three, we identified three areas that we felt we need to focus on to really embed these, these interventions or approaches within mental health services. So one is the culture, and the culture is so important and we've done some research on this as well. What we're referring to of the culture of a mental health service um, refers to how do they how does that service approach physical health does it remember that that people have bodies as well as minds um, and what can we what can we do to to address that training and i've just spoken about the the training impact it's both sides it's our, our physical health workforce need more training and our mental health workforce need better training and this photo was taken in in bangladesh on the beach in cox's bazaar after one of the workshops we did and this was the, a bunch of psychologists, and this was their idea to draw a brain in the sand, and then they were doing push-ups in the brain as they flew a drone over and made a short little film, and that was how they communicated what they'd taken from, from, from the workshop. Finally, infrastructure. Now, this is, is really important. We, can't, we, we need some level of infrastructure within services. So the amount of programs we've seen that, you know, within a, a hospital, there's a, a broom cupboard that's handed over with a bunch of TheraBands and that's kind of the start. And that's okay to start with, um, but we need to really be thinking about the environments, the infrastructure. Um, are we creating a, a safe, accessible exercise environment? Okay, this brings me to, to the, the a project that I'm really excited about at the moment, which is called Addy Moves. Um, and this is something that there's a lot of colleagues I need to mention here. So Dr. Grace McEwen, Dr. Oscar Letterman, um, Chiara Mastro Giovanni, Uzma Chowdhury, and there's others as well who are, who are instrumental in this project. For those that don't know, that's Addison Road Community Centre in Marrickville, Sydney, um, and or commonly known as Addy Road. And Addy Road is a really unique community service. On site, there are over 40 community services 
and social services. So there's legal services, there's gender-based violence services, refugee and asylum seeker services, there's art spaces. In addition, there's the food pantry that you can see there. And that's one of the main issues that Addy Road deals with, which is food insecurity. So people that can't afford groceries or get access to, to cheap or free groceries. So in addition to those 40 services, Addy Road now has Addy Moves, um, which on day one when Grace and I picked up the keys looked something like that. Um, today, I'm very excited to say that that's what it looks like. Um, that mural in the back was painted by three refugees and asylum seekers, and they donated that to us, which was which was an amazing gesture. And that was part of the process of creating a space that was owned by the people that we were trying to support. So we don't refer to it as a gym. It's kind of a not gym or a for-purpose exercise space or whatever we want to call it. We still haven't landed on a, a proper name. But the idea is that this, you know, we want it to, to feel nothing like a commercial gym. So in order to do that, we've been through a very lengthy co-design process alongside colleagues with lived experience to understand what's needed and what do we need to do. Now, we have three pillars of Addy Moves. One is, is research. One is training and education. And for me, that's absolutely critical because thinking about the future workforce, future exercise physiologists, future physiotherapists, dietitians, public health, they have an opportunity to be exposed to, to clients that otherwise they wouldn't have, clients who are otherwise excluded um, from typical health promotion interventions. So that's been a big part of what we're doing and we're hoping that this will be the, you know, the prac that all our students will, will want to do um, and community service and impact. Now, as an example of that training and education piece, this is a picture of a training day we had with uh, Joshua Hall from STARTS. And Josh is a clinical psychologist. So STARTS is the service for the treatment and rehabilitation of trauma and torture survivors. And he ran a half-day workshop for, for our staff on, on working with refugees and asylum seekers. So again, how we're trying to bring these workforces closer together. The priority areas for us going forward for the next 12 months for me, all fits under this banner of trauma and social disadvantage um, and thinking about how we can reach. And we, we recognise there are going to be people that fit across multiple of these boxes. Um, so refugees and asylum seekers is, is one. Um, Revenue New South Wales, I'll mention this because this is a project that I'm, I'm really excited about. So uh, Dr Grace McEwen is leading this. Uh, we're working to see, explore whether Addy Moves can be registered under a work development order. Now, for those that don't know, a work development order is a scheme um, set up by the government whereby people, uh, certain people, and that includes people living with mental illness, refugees and asylum seekers who have been issued fines can potentially pay off those fines by attending certain programs. And we're trying to explore whether or not something like a, a supported exercise space could be something where they could come and, and pay off that fine. Um, so we're doing some work to get, together with Merrick the Legal and, and Kingsford Legal, Kensington Legal, sorry. But an example of a person that we're, we're talking there, and a lawyer told us a, a story of an 18-year-old asylum seeker with schizophrenia who stole a tin of cat food. Now, finding that person does absolutely nothing for society at all. Um, something that potentially provides uh, uh, some structure, some mentoring, a, a space where they can come, but also at the same time potentially get physically healthier. Um, and obviously autonomy and choice is absolutely critical. We're not punishing people with burpees. That's not going to work. Um, but it's about that, that, that supportive environment. Financial hardship is another one and the food insecurity, which we've talked about. Um, and also sexual and gender-based violence, which is a critical area and I think one of the priority areas for, for an exercise and allied health workforce going forward because we know that people experiencing GBV are, are, are far more likely to experience health uh, uh, chronic health conditions and to access health services. So there's a real opportunity and I think a gap in the, in the knowledge and confidence of that workforce. Now, coming back to how we set Addy Moves up, it took over 12 months of a detailed co-design process that was led by, by Dr. Grace McEwen. And that involved interviewing service users and service providers. And this was a focus on, on refugees and asylum seekers. Grace did a, a bunch of those interviews and filmed those interviews. She then analysed the transcripts. We edited the interviews into a short film and then held co-design workshops where we played that film back to the participants. 
to get another round of feedback to make sure that we had captured everything. And we learned things that we would never have thought about. For example, childcare. Um, for example, access to exercise clothing. Ensuring that we had women-only times. Ensuring that it, the space was private and we had curtains. Um, so things that that unless we asked, we would we would never have have recognised. And for me, it's always Faye's voice in my head and some of the advice that Faye provided ASTSS around co-design and around what should our first question be, and that the first question should always be what should our first question be. And and Faye, that that has stuck with me for a very long time. That's what we were we were discussing here today with with the physios. Um, so this was a, a really you know amazing process that Grace went through. She's now written a paper that's that's submitted as well. Um, but what it identified was six priority areas. And for me, it's not priorities. I call these our guiding principles. Because for me, this is what makes Addy Moves different to a commercial gym. It what makes it different to any other exercise space. Um, and I'll quickly talk you through what they are. I will say that together with Kiara and Uzma, who are our, our EPs on the ground, um, and Grace, every week we are trying to discuss how can we do better in each of these six priorities, and it's a learning process because each one could take a lot of time. Um, but the first issue is cultural safety. So how do we make sure that cultures uh, that we value, acknowledge, and welcome all cultures? Emotional safety, so that people feel understood and supported. Accessibility. Um, I'll give... Two examples of accessibility, we've now translated all our referral documentation into 12 languages. We also have access to interpreters and translators uh, that speak over 40 different languages. Uh, we've also teamed up with an amazing charity called Thread Together who provide us with free brand new exercise clothing. For people that can't afford exercise clothing, um, they can let us, let, we can, as part of our assessment, we'll, we can let them know that we have access to brand new clothes um, and we're hoping to get sneakers soon as well so that we can remove, again, one of those barriers that might prevent people. Support to address basic needs. Now, this is really interesting because if you create, if we think about something like a gym or a space where people can come and exercise, it's destigmatizing, it's accessible, it's highly likely that we might get people who have unmet basic needs, whether it's food, whether it's medical whatever it might be, so how can we ensure that we're equipped to, to link in with those services to refer and to ensure that we can help people to support them to meet those basic needs? Physical activity literacy is a really important one here. Basically, we're not just talking about understanding the benefits of activity, but we're talking about reclaiming exercise away from, from weight loss and aesthetics and moving totally away from that. The idea of health, of well-being, mental health, how we feel, yeah, and the social connection as well. And that was the final one, social community connection. We know there's a huge opportunity for these programs, um, whether it's you know dancing within certain communities, whether it's food from certain communities that want to come and share. How do we how do we utilize that to build that social connection and support people to what they want to do? Um, so that's part of our, our our intake material, but again, we can make these slides available and it's online as well. Now, I'm really lucky to, I often get the opportunity to talk to both mental health professionals and physical health professionals. And this is how I, I like to finish at, at the moment. These are my last couple of slides. So the first is with five questions that I want to ask mental health professionals that, that might be online. And so these are five questions to ask, are you a physical health informed mental health professional? My first question is, do you know the physical activity guidelines? Now, the guidelines are, are just a guideline. But for those that don't know, these are the World Health Organization guidelines, 150 minutes moderate to vigorous physical activity per week is the recommendation. I need to stress here that if you're not achieving those guidelines, you can still benefit and still experience mental health benefits. It's just the rough guideline. Yeah, but it's a good to have in mind. Secondly, are you aware of the National Nutritional Guidelines? And that's just a bit of a stab at Dr. Scott Teasdale that it's more than peas and carrots. You know, we know there is there's really important work around food and mood, and Scott's been doing some fantastic work in that area, as well as the Food and Mood Centre at Deakin with Felice Jacker and Adrian O'Neill. There is lots of work around nutrition. Is my physical activity and nutrition messaging psychologically safe? Am I talking about things like enjoyment? Am I avoiding stigmatizing language and avoiding focusing on aesthetics and weight loss? 
Um, at Addy Moves, we we re- we probably don't even weigh people, most people that come through the door, because we're not interested in weight as an outcome. We're interested in all the other benefits that we can get from activity, and we recognise the evidence that to change weight, we need to focus on food. You know, the evidence is clear around that. Um, so that messaging is really, really important. Do I know how to access additional physical health support? Now, this can be, you know, lifestyle change, behaviour change can be very complicated um, and people need a lot of support. So we shouldn't just expect that people can do it themselves. So ensuring that we know where those local physical health services are that we can support or refer people to. Finally, this is one of the most important points for any mental health professional. Do I practice what I preach? Now, here again, we're not talking about mental health professionals being crossfitters or being elite athletes. We're talking about that that internal autonomous motivation, understanding these benefits because they experience it for themselves. We've got good evidence from from scaling these programs in mental health services in Australia um, that we need to start with staff. This comes back to that culture and it comes back to the workforce and thinking about do they understand the benefits. And I've got good examples from, from, you know, a story I often tell about an older male nurse that that was quite reluctant when we were working in his unit and he kind of told me blankly that if he wanted to be a personal trainer, he would have been a personal trainer, but he was a mental health nurse, so it wasn't his job. But gradually, because of an intervention we were running around him, things started changing within the unit. Um, And eventually he was then, you know, he asked if he could have a Fitbit as well, which was part of the intervention we, we provided. Um, and a few weeks later, he was coming and talking to the dietitian about what he had made for lunch. Now, that had a big shift on his behaviour, but also then what he was doing with his patients that he was supporting. Um, and he started thinking about other ways that he can then bring in these sorts of approaches into his work. Now, over on the other side is, is, is for the physical health professionals. You know, are you mental health informed? Now, what I mean by that, first of all, have you completed mental health first aid training? There's a, there's a lot of um, places that I'm going to at the moment where they don't have access to mental health first aid training. It doesn't it doesn't exist. So we're lucky in Australia we do. Our students now have to do this as part of their training at uni, which is fantastic. But building foundational mental health skills in that workforce is critical. Secondly, do we actively consider the unique barriers experienced by people living with poor mental health? So what we're talking about there, the social determinants, the conditions in which people are born, live, work, play. Um, Symptoms, so psychiatric symptomatology, poor physical health, the side effects of of medication. These can all play a role in in someone's ability to participate or how they can participate. So we need to be considering these in, in programs. The same thing about is my messaging psychologically safe? Very important. We avoid that focus on aesthetics. And finally, do they know how to access additional mental health support? Do they know where their local mental health professionals are and the barriers of their scope of practice and where that that ends and where they can refer? All right, so I think we're, this is my, my absolute last slide. Now, I'm going to save everyone the horror of me actually singing, but this is just some takeaways with five songs that hopefully people, if, if nothing else sticks in your mind, maybe these will. Um, the first, we can all guess who this is, the Beatles. Some people need more support in order to participate. Our resources have to match our needs. Yeah, it's absolutely critical. We can't set up programs hoping to reach the most disadvantaged, the most vulnerable, um, but by simply providing some infrastructure. So we've got to really think about matching those resources to the needs. A bit of Johnny Nash. This, for me, is about the emerging mental health workforces. What does that look like? What is a, what is a mental health clinician of the future? What is a, a physio, an EP? What is the training in the future? I think we've got a lot of opportunity there to bring this closer together. Likewise, that safety net, these, these programs as being something that's accessible, something that's acceptable to people that they want to go to, doesn't carry the stigma. So how can we use that as a safety net to, to, to catch people? And then not only catch them, but as Tom Petty suggests, funnel them into traditional mental health services. We've got good evidence around co-location of services, but how do we we better integrate these physical and and mental health approaches? Um, And one more, which is absolutely critical, and again, just recognising the work that Grace has done um, around co-design and co-production. 
Um, there is, you know, it's a lot of what we've been discussing here in Colombia, but recognizing different types of knowledge. Now, in me as an exercise practitioner, I've got one little bit of knowledge. Someone with lived experience of whether it's here in Colombia, whether it's in Australia living with a, a mental illness, has another type of knowledge that's, that's you know, super important in, in many respects it's more important so how do we work together and, and leverage that that knowledge that everyone brings to create safer more accessible programs um i lots of acknowledgements so dr grace McEwen, dr oscar letterman who were instrumental in in setting up addy fiara who's our ep and phd student at the moment doing fantastic work focusing on on integrating scalable WHO interventions around mental health and physical activity. Dr. Gulsha Kurt is a clinical psychologist from Turkey who's guiding us around the mental health support. Um, Carla, who provides invaluable uh, administrative support to our team, we'd be very lost without her. Uzma, who is a junior EP, she was a prac student that started with us um, as a as a exercise physiology practicum student. She's now employed and enrolled in a Masters of Research which is fantastic. Scott, who I've mentioned, is doing great work around nutrition, um, and Dr. Kenny Wright, who's really helping us hopefully create the best practicum opportunity that we possibly can. Um, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Hopefully the internet held up, and I'm, I'm really happy to, to take any, any questions. Thank you so much. That was such a brilliant presentation. Um, so I already have some questions that people sent in a little earlier, which I will start to go through. And then if others have more questions, they can add them to the chat or the Q&A, whichever one's easiest. So one of the things that people have asked about, Simon, is, and I know you've touched on a lot of this, but it's around motivation and what are some of your key strategies or tips on how to motivate um ourselves but perhaps others that we're supporting to exercise especially if they do not enjoy it and I know you've talked about exercise kind of being part of physical activity but yeah what are some of your your thoughts around that there's lots of things to consider so one one of the most interesting studies for me was looking at uh, people's experience with sport when they were at school and the impact that had on our relationship with activity and, and physical activity in adulthood. There's a lot of things to recognise that if someone's had a really bad experience in, in PE um, or, or as an adolescent or as a young person, that can have a big impact on their, their potential enjoyment. Um, so I think there's a couple of things, though. There's, there's people, we sort of joke, there's people who enjoy physical activity and those that haven't found the right type of activity in the right place for them. So that's where we need we need more environments. We need more uh, resources to actually, you know, we, we've argued earlier this year in this video and Elizabeth touched on that, about the idea about exercise being a right because given the relationship with health, we should be thinking about, well, everyone should have the right to participate in a form of activity that they enjoy because of the impact on health. Now, if that's the case, what are we doing to resource that to create those services and those environments that will support people, particularly those that are excluded and disengaged? Um, so it's not a it's not a tangible answer right now. I think we can. I'd come back to the basics: thinking about the social connection or support, thinking about finding a buddy, thinking about the referral processes we have available in Australia now. Um, people can chat to a GP; they can get access to a referral to see an EP or a dietitian if they have some sort of chronic disease. There are community supports available. Um, there are you know, amazing programs like what Flourish runs, um, but there's also other community groups, things like Live Life, Get Active, that provide free um, or, or heavily subsidised community-based exercise programs. Um, but we've got to support, we've got to support each other as well, and practitioners need to, need to think about what, what we can do. You know, peer support is also a critical factor. You know, we know that we should be really thinking about how can we engage peers and the work that Grace did for her PhD. Uh, we looked at having online Facebook groups for people with post-traumatic stress disorder for emergency service workers. And that was co-facilitated by an exercise physiologist and a peer support worker with lived experience. Um, they were able to, to, to discuss things around motivation that we couldn't without that lived experience. So I think that's... that's Absolutely critical. I hope that kind of 
provides some yeah, absolutely. No, it does. Um, and like you said, there's a lot to unpack, I think, in someone's motivation and what they have access to to be able to to engage in physical activity. Some of the questions that came through earlier, um, and, I, and I've sort of joined them together, and I think you touched on this a little bit in the Firth study that you referred to, uh, but people were asking about the different types of mental health conditions and exercise. And in particular, are there any types of movements or exercises that would be helpful for certain mental health conditions such as the ones that you put up you know around depression and bipolar and ADHD what you know what's the your thoughts on that I'll I'll reiterate again the the evidence is about let's get people moving the type of activity doesn't seem to matter so if I was to summarize you know all the evidence here in sort of two sentences I would say something is better than nothing if you're doing something try for a bit more or something a bit different. So the way the way I think about activity or exercise is that it's a stress on the body and then the body adapts, yeah? So what we want to look at is what type of movement are people doing? And if someone really is, is not doing anything, then we think we start talking about um, uh, the physical activity in general. So how can we find opportunities throughout the day? And there's a new approach around called exercise snacking. We're just thinking about getting little little snack bites of activity throughout the day, and that can be great, and that's a good place to start. Um, from there, we might progress to thinking about some structured bouts of activity. It might be five minutes. It might be 10 minutes. It might be a walk to the letterbox 10 times, whatever it might be. Um, but having someone that you can, you can work with around that program can be really helpful. Um, you know, if we, it takes a long time to develop habits, exercise is often something that people have an all or nothing relationship with. So they have to feel good because they're like, well, at the moment I'm exercising. So it gives us more, more um, motivation to, to be able to do more. But then when we've dropped out or we've, we've stepped back, it can be hard to just engage again. And often we need a little bit of a push. So we know from the evidence that we need to think about a combination of one-on-one -on -one and group-based approaches to help people, to support people. Yeah. Excellent. And would you say, um, Simon, because one of the other questions we got was around um, there'd be people on this call today and those who may be supporting them who support people who are on medications that can be quite sedating. Um, so, again, just picking up on what you were saying there, I really like that idea of um, snack bites, so sort of starting with something. is Again, would you say that's sort of similar to what other advice would you give in relation to that? Yeah, around the, the small bouts. So, I mean, there's a few things, but having having a structured program can be really important. The The other thing that's really interesting at the moment, there's a move away. Typically, we talk or health professionals are trained around SMART goals. That's kind of mm -hmm. the cornerstone of a lot of these health promotion programs. And for those that aren't aware, it stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timely. Now, I'd really encourage people to look at work by by Professor Christian Swan, um, who's doing some fantastic stuff challenging that very idea that SMART goals should be the default. So he's actually looking at alternative approaches, open goals, uh, for, particularly for people in, in, in the, the initial phase of, of behaviour change. Open goals, just today I'm going to try and do a bit more, um, can be really useful in that initial period to engage people. Um, so I think we've got to be a bit creative about that, but also seek help where it's available for people that are, that are trained and, and that have some expertise. And that point you mentioned around medication, absolutely. Um, and that was a, a point in my slide for the physical health professionals about considering those, the, the unique barriers experienced by people living with, with poor mental health. So we know that, you know, the majority of the population is inactive based on the guidelines. If you then add the additional barriers that people experience living with with poor mental health or exposed to trauma or whatever it might be, um, it can be even more difficult. But we've got good evidence that we can, um, that was Christian Swan was the the name. Of the, um, I can I can send the slides available. Um, sorry, it just popped up. Um, mm -hmm. So the the medication, it yes, it's a barrier, but we, we do know that it can be done. We can provide programs that can support people, even even people that are that are taking medication like clozapine or, or other antipsychotic medication. It's it's more challenging. We need more support. We need better resources to support those people to be able to participate. 
So, you know, I would just, I'd stress that the evidence is there. You know, we've, we've got the, the the clinical trials are there around that this can be effective. The challenge is in that implementation. It's in that, well, how do we actually make this happen? You know, there's some other fantastic stories from places like the Netherlands. Um, Jeroen Dienik is another fantastic researcher doing amazing work in their long-term stay hospital. They built an outdoor gym that the patient built. Um you know, there's just this uh, this amazing community and program that's happened there. But again, the, the culture of that service, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really, really great advice. So in the um, Q&A channel, there is a, question, a couple of questions in there as well. Um, what are your thoughts on how we educate and empower health professionals to promote physical activity, those who are not trained in exercise? G'day, Liz. I mean, Liz is better placed than me to answer that question. What what I would say is the work that I'm doing, uh, sort of in in low resource or humanitarian settings, with there's there's a lot of interest because we, there's not as many resources, and so it, there's sort of there's a we're sort of more more resourceful with what we have, and that means that that the the mental health professionals there have been you know, really interested in it and and um, accepting and, and interested in how we can consider these approaches because it's potentially another tool in their tool belt. And also recognising that if we partner them with, for example, the local, you know, even inside the refugee camp, we have community leaders that are running sports. We have, you know, whether it's teachers that are, that are doing stuff or just, just people from the community that are leading, you know, the, the cricket club or whatever it might be. Um, teaming those up, so that we can better utilize the expertise of each means that we can enhance everything. So Liz, I'm not really answering that, but I think empowering first, it's got to be, they've got to experience it for themselves. You know, we know that if you, you know, it's got to, it, it takes time, but if we've got health professionals, I've had this plenty of times, particularly mental health professionals who just aren't interested. They say this isn't for them. We can, we can shift that, but it takes time and it takes understanding what, what are the issues with them if it's their knowledge or their confidence? What are the actual barriers or their attitudes? And then how do we shift that? Um, for example, we we know there's a difference between typically nurses versus psychologists in terms of what their, their needs are um, and how our training approaches need to address whether it's a lack of knowledge or whether it's simply a, a lack of time based on where they are. So I'm conscious of the time and um, there are so many more questions on my list and ones that are coming through the Q&A channel, but I'll tr if we can try and address a couple of them um, sort of quickly, not to rush you, Simon, but um, the next one by Liz was, have you done any studies on health professionals' perception of physical activity and likelihood to yep. encourage or promote? Yeah, we've got interesting data from Australia and India, Bangladesh and northeast Syria and practitioners who are more who are more active themselves are more likely to promote these interventions. Um, so we also typically see that knowledge is really high among health professionals. No one's disputing that activity is good for us. Um, it's often just that they don't have time or they don't have the knowledge or they don't have the confidence. And we can work with that. It just takes a bit of time. And the other question here from uh, Gloria is, as an exercise professional, what's your advice on how to best support the families of people with serious mental health conditions to help empower their family members in becoming physically healthy? Yeah, so we know that there's an impact on the physical health of carers as well. Um, and there's some emerging emerging research there looking at, well, can we structure programs to focus on on the family? Let's get the family unit. Um, involved. So, for example, when we're working with young people with with psychosis, and we were running cooking groups with those young people, but then recognizing that then they're actually going home; they're not the ones cooking for themselves. So then that was a, a catalyst, saying, "Well, we need to actually invite the whole family." So, yeah, I think uh, thinking about extending who the intervention is for and who who we can invite is really important. That's great. Thank you so much. I think there's so much for us to consider in what you've said, um, you know, around access and, and privilege and, and rights and 
all the different components of physical activity and how do we as professionals support that. Um, I think there's, yeah, it's been such a fantastic presentation. We're so fortunate to have you speak from from where you are, which also looks and sounds spectacular. So um, there's other questions. I think there might have been one about sharing the slides, um, which yeah, would yeah, be for sure. really really great if you could. Um, so thank you so much, um, Associate Professor Simon Rosenbaum. We really, really appreciate your time. Um, and to everybody else too, um, Donna, Faye, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your introductions as well. As I said, I'm sure we could keep talking all afternoon, um, but we, we shouldn't. <laughs> and thanks again. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, we'll share the slides and we really appreciate your time to talk about this really important topic. Flourish Australia is a community-based not-for-profit, providing practical support to people with a lived experience of a complex mental health issue. We work alongside and complement other services to provide complex mental health support. This can include GPs, psychologists, other service providers and the government. Flourish Australia has supported me in so many ways. They've helped me understand and manage my mental health. They've provided assistance with living and they've also helped me find a house for my son and I. Flourish Australia has provided me with work. I think employment is really important for my mental health because it sort of gives you something to do with your time but you're also giving back to the community which is really important for me. We are a person-led organisation. We develop relationships with people accessing our services. We listen to people, for they are their own experts in identifying their recovery journey. What sets us apart from many organisations is that a significant proportion of that workforce are peer workers. We're integrated in teams across our service footprint and programs. People feel safe really quickly with somebody that they think has been through some similar experiences. It's a beautiful kind of magic that peer work has that I don't see in any other discipline in quite the same way. Flourish Australia has supported me with my anxiety. It's a very friendly environment and our supervisors are always there to help us. It's about connecting with other people. It's also about family, like we feel like a family here. That's something I really appreciate about Flourish Australia. Our programs help people become connected with their communities to make friends, find work, learn new skills, find a home and gain a sense of achievement. It makes Flourish Australia a safe place, a place where mental well-being thrives.